Hey everyone, this lesson is on fluoroquinolone antibiotics. The fluoroquinolones or the quinolones all end in the suffix floxacin. So ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and moxifloxacin are all examples of fluoroquinolones. So ciprofloxacin itself is a second generation, levofloxacin is a third generation, and moxifloxacin is a fourth generation uh, fluoroquinolone. They are all absorbed well orally, but a key point in their use is not to use them in children. So don't use fluoroquinolones in children, and it's because of particular adverse effects or reactions, which we'll talk about later in the video. They are well distributed. They distribute to the kidneys, lungs, bones, stool, and white blood cells. Bacterial targets of fluoroquinolones include some gram-positives, including streptococcus and methicillin-sensitive Staphylococcus aureus, or MSSA. So not MRSA, but MSSA. And they are also very good in treating gram-negative bacilli, which include enterobacteria, E. coli, so gram-negative rods, uh, Haemophilus influenza, Moraxella catarralis, Seminella, Shigella, Campylobacter, Legionella. So Seminella, Shigella, and Campylobacter are all examples of um, GI infections. Chlamydia and Pseudomonas, in particular, uh, ciprofloxacin. So. For pseudomonal coverage, we use ciprofloxacin out of all of the fluoroquinolones. Also has some activity against mycoplasma bac bacteria as well, but they are not very useful against anaerobes, except in the case of moxifloxacin. And remember I mentioned that moxifloxacin is a fourth generation fluoroquinolone. So the fluoroquinolones all have different spectrums of activity depending on their generation. So the earlier generations of fluoroquinolones, like the second generation, ciprofloxacin, and the third generation, levofloxacin, have good activity against gram negatives. And they're good, they have good activity against aerobes. And as we move along to later generations, including the fourth generation fluoroquinolone moxifloxacin, moxifloxacin has additional activity against gram-positive uh, bacteria and anaerobes. So the way we can remember this is with each generation, it adds on to the previous generation. The activity against gram-negatives is maintained as we go to later generations. So moxifloxin has similar activity against gram-negatives and aerobes as does ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin, but it also has additional activity against anaerobes and gram-positive. So as we move along the generations of fluoroquinolones, they gain additional activity, but they don't lose their previous activity from previous generations. I hope that makes sense. So some infections that we can use fluoroquinolones to treat include UTIs because the majority of UTIs are caused by gram-negative rods. And the antibiotic that we would use for UTIs would be ciprofloxacin because in antibiotic stewardship, we want to use the lowest and most narrow spectrum antibiotic as possible. So we could use moxifloxacin for UTIs, but because it also covers anaerobes and gram positives, we wouldn't generally use it. We would use the lowest or the earliest generation possible. So ciprofloxacin would be used for UTIs. For pneumonia, we generally use moxifloxacin. It can cover some other gram positives. It may cover um, some Staphylococcus aureus, uh, which would be the most common cause of a post-infectious pneumonia. So generally, we would use moxifloxacin for pneumonia. We could also use um, fluoroquinolones to treat SEDs, including chlamydia and cancroid, and also, as I mentioned before, pseudomonal infections, but we would use ciprofloxacin to treat a pseudomonal infection. So how do fluoroquinolones work? What is the mechanism of action of the quinolones? They are all bactericidal and they are rapidly bactericidal because they inhibit bacterial DNA synthesis.
They do this by inhibiting two specific bacterial enzymes. The first one is DNA gyrase, and the second one is topoisomerase 4. And DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 4 generally do the same function. So what happens in bacterial DNA synthesis is that the bacterial DNA becomes unraveled to allow a DNA polymerase to make a copy of the corresponding DNA strand. And in the process of unraveling, the DNA can become uh, tightly coiled in a process known as supercoiling. So if you can imagine, if you're unraveling a coil of some kind, it can become very tight in the fork of that unraveling. So what DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 4 do is that they relieve the supercoiling. They relieve the tightness and the pressure in the DNA strands during this process. But when there are fluoroquinolones around, they can bind to the DNA gyrase or topoisomerase 4, inhibiting their ability to relieve supercoiling. This leads to an increased tightness and pressure within the DNA strands leading to DNA fragmentation and damage, which ultimately lead to bacterial cell death. That is how the fluoroquinolones work. But because of overuse of fluoroquinolones, there has been development of antibiotic resistance to the fluoroquinolones. And bacteria develop antibiotic resistance through developing mutations in chromosomal genes for DNA gyrase and or topoisomerase 4. So Mutations develop in DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 4, preventing the fluoroquinolones from binding and inhibiting them. And another way bacteria have developed antibiotic resistance to fluoroquinolones is through the development of efflux pumps. And these are very interesting mechanisms whereby the bacteria can develop pumps that they can insert into their membrane to essentially pump out the antibiotics. So essentially they can send the fluoroquinolones back out so that the fluoroquinolones don't develop enough concentration within the bacteria to cause uh, any dysfunction or cell death. So this is a couple of interesting mechanisms by which the bacteria can develop antibiotic resistance to the quinolones. So what are some of the adverse reactions to fluoroquinolones? Some of the biggest ones and some of the most common are gastrointestinal symptoms. These include anorexia, nausea, and vomiting, abdominal pain, and discomfort. There can be some nervous system effects, including mild headache, dizziness, insomnia, and mood disruptions. And some more rare uh, adverse reactions to the fluoroquinolones, including delirium, hallucinations, seizures, memory impairments. These can be more, um, can have more of an effect in geriatric populations. There's also allergic reactions and rash to the fluoroquinolones. And one of the big ones for the fluoroquinolone specifically is arthropathy. So there can be cartilage erosions of weight-bearing joints. And this is the reason why we don't want to use systemic fluoroquinolones in children less than the age of 18. That's why I mentioned we don't want to use fluoroquinolones in children. And... Additionally, we don't want to use them in pregnant women because the fetus is also developing cartilage in utero and the fluoroquinolones seem to cause damage to cartilage, especially in uh, individuals still developing their cartilage. The fluoroquins are also known to cause QT prolongation, particularly moxifloxacin and gadifloxacin. And there's also tendinopathy and tendon rupture. The Achilles tendon seems to be the most common um, to have tendinopathy and tendon rupture. And other adverse reactions to the fluoroquinolones include acute liver failure, hypo and hyperglycemia. So again, a couple of key points I want you to take from this slide is that the fluoroquinolones can cause arthropathy, so cartilage erosions in weight-bearing joints, so don't use them in children, don't use them in pregnant women, 
They can cause QT prolongation, so always look for other medications that are also QT prolonging, and they cause tendinopathy and tendon rupture, so we have to be very careful with their use. Anyways, I hope you found this lesson helpful. That was a lesson on fluoroquinolones. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And also, please check out my other antibiotic lessons in my infectious disease playlist. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.